Thank you very much. This securities litigation panel will cover recent legal developments that affect institutional investors. Topics covered will include United States Supreme Court cases, event-driven litigation, and global securities litigation. Please help me welcome Jonathan Davidson, who will moderate this session and introduce his distinguished panel. Thank you. Cut us on. Yeah. Well, the first one I was just going to read them. Yeah. So Whatever. Yeah. Just go on. Just yeah. just skip the skip the slide thing. All right. Prototypical. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Davidson with Kessler Topaz. It's great to be with you all as always here at the annual conference. Um, <clears throat> for the mothers in the room, hope you had a great day yesterday. Uh, welcome to recent legal developments. Uh, we've done this session now for each of the past five years uh, and will once again endeavor to provide you with an update of all things securities litigation, both here and abroad in a number of different areas. And I'm fortunate to have a well-qualified panel of my colleagues to do just that. Um, Darren Robbins from Robbins Geller, Chet Waldman from Wolf Popper, and our friend Jeremy Lieberman who, uh, with Pomerantz, who I think the subway's just running a little late, or maybe he's stuck on a train, but he should be here momentarily. Um, so we'll, he'll jump in uh, when he arrives. Um, so we have a bit of an ambitious agenda, so let's kind of dispense with any more formalities, except to say that if you do have any questions, we'd, we'd certainly like this to be as interactive as possible. So raise a hand and uh, we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll call on you. We'll also try to leave some time uh, for questions at the end. Um, so Darren, let's get started with you. Uh, and let's begin with the United States Supreme Court. Um, historically, the court has been uh, slow to take up securities cases. But over the past decade or so, that's changed with the court increasingly willing to, uh, to take up securities cases. Um, this 2017-2018 term was no exception with several important cases on the docket. Um, your firm was involved in one of the cases involving a company called Cyan. Uh, that oral argument was heard back in November. If you would, um, please give uh, uh, an overview of the case, the issue that that case presented, and how the court ruled back in March. Well, at the risk of providing discussion of anything uh more dry than tariffs, I'll talk a little bit about Supreme Court precedent. Um, this case is called uh, Cyan, and it has a few interesting things uh, involved. And unfortunately, to give a full perspective, you have to go into a little bit of background. But the case involved um, a telecommunications company, which was uh, sued by a couple of Pennsylvania county pension funds for misrepresentations in connection with an initial offering and the case made its way to the Supreme Court. One interesting thing about that was that it involved a case coming through the state court system. And for those of you who are non-lawyers, you won't know this, but about only 10% of Supreme Court cases actually come through state court systems as opposed to the federal courts of appeal. Um, and it dealt with whether claims brought in state court, class actions brought in state court can be removed to federal court. Now embedded in that is a lot of legalese. Removed is uh, something that non-lawyers probably don't even know what it means, and it basically means can someone unilaterally take your case and take it from a state court and put it into a federal court. And to understand this in full context, you have to go back a few years. Uh, about uh, 85 years ago, in response to the financial meltdown of the Great Depression, about a month or two after FDR was elected, um, 
the, uh, the first bill was presented to him in, in May, actually this month, in 1933, to protect against securities fraud. Before that, there had been no federal protections against the uh, securities fraud, and in response to what was then a uh, pervasive financial crisis of the likes we just went through over the last decade ourselves, they enacted this law. And uh, this law has a really weird provision in it, which became the subject of the Supreme Court's discussion, and that is, even though it's a federal law, you could bring it in state court, a claim under this 1933 Securities Act, and if you brought it in state court, it could not be brought up to federal court. It's actually a very anomalous provision. So the next year, the 1934 Act was adopted, which most of you are familiar with, the, uh, the, the real bulwark against uh, securities fraud uh, in, in the federal system are these two laws, the 1933 Act and the 1934 Act. They went along for about 60 years. In the mid-90s, there were two new laws adopted, one in 1995 and one in 1998. And so this 1998 law changed the way that uh, class actions are litigated in state courts. And what became the most interesting thing about the argument, I guess, is this 1998 law laid against the 1933 law. And uh, uh, the Supreme Court threw its arms up during oral argument, uh, and, and many of you have probably uh, seen an oral argument or two uh, or the outcome of one. And the Supreme Court repeatedly referred to this law as gibberish which is pretty strong language. Uh, in the opinion, uh, Justice Kagan, who penned in a, a unanimous opinion, which a pro-shareholder, nine to zero opinion, affirming the appeal of a law from the West Coast is like a unicorn. This never happened. So it was uh, uh, good luck for investors, uh, and I don't know that it'll be repeated, but basically after concluding that the new law in 1998, new, 20 years old, but new relative to 1933, uh, concluded that it was gibberish, uh, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of investors, and, and used, again, some really kind of uh, powerful language. Like, for example, Justice Kagan, uh, in, in the decision, says that usually Congress doesn't um, uh, place elephants into mouse holes, and that the other side would need monster arguments to overcome what is clear statutory text uh, in one regard, and then in another regard called it gibberish. So I guess the bottom line is, is that we take great solace in the fact that there was at least one pro-investor opinion that's been issued from this Supreme Court. And, and like you said, there's been a proclivity of the Supreme Court to take uh, investor uh, securities fraud, investor claims far more than they did historically. So I, I, I don't know what to read into it. Um, I don't think it changes the landscape dramatically. The bottom line is what this does is allow pension funds to choose between state or federal court in connection with um, IPO claims. And so it's not going to change anyone's life here, but I think it's indicative of at least a court that's willing to listen and fairly adjudicate um, you know, investor protection claims. Thanks, Darren. So, so Chet, let's go to that point and let's talk about impact. Um, what do you think the impact is going to be for institutional investors, for public pension funds in this room? And importantly, maybe, uh, what, how do you think the lead plaintiff process is going to go where you find yourself with these parallel federal and state court actions? Okay. Well, first of all, I think the first impact that you're going to see an uptick in these 1933 Act claims being filed in state court. Right now, they've been filed almost exclusively in California because prior to the Cyan decision, California was amenable to these claims where, for example, New York was not. Now you're going to see an uptick in these cases filed throughout the country, not just in California. And there's three reasons for that. One is the pleading standard in state court is more favorable to plaintiffs than the federal standard. Secondly, under the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, or the PSLRA, there is an automatic stay provision in federal court where as soon as a defendant moves to dismiss a case, discovery is stayed. That does not necessarily apply in state court. And third, I think we're gonna talk about this a little later, the current administration has been appointing more federal judges that are business friendly. So state courts may be a more friendly jurisdiction for institutional investors and others to file these purely 33 Act claims. 
Now, you raised the big issue here, the elephant in the room, is, well, what happens if there is a restatement, for example, that goes back three years that impacts not only an IPO, but aftermarket purchases in that period? Those are 34 Act claims. If you have a case that has both IPO claims and normal fraud claims, they have to be brought in federal court. The Cyan decision is only when there's exclusively an IPO case. That can be brought in state court. So now what is going to happen is you are going to see cases filed simultaneously in federal court and state court. Now, many of you are familiar with the PSLRA lead plaintiff provisions. Basically, when somebody files a federal securities case, you send out notice to the world, and people have 60 days to come forward to seek to be a lead plaintiff. At the end of that period, the applicants are reviewed, and whoever has the largest financial loss is the presumptive lead plaintiff. Well, the PSLRA doesn't apply in state court. The state court can choose from various applicants based on factors such as who filed first or who had the best complaint. It could take the largest shareholder as the lead, but it doesn't have to. Why this is a problem is there's at least part of an overlapping class where the federal case and the state case are representing the same people. And this can be a huge problem if the case wants to settle, for example. It's going to cause the federal and state lead plaintiffs to fight each other. So what I see happening is at a minimum, the lead plaintiffs in federal court are going to move to intervene in the state court or even file complaints in the state courts to try to convince the state courts that only one leader should lead both the federal action and the state action. And that's going to be judge specific of how they rule that. So. If not, there's going to be a mess if the case tries to resolve. Now, all of this may be moot if Grunfest clauses are permitted. Well, what is that? Well, Joseph Grunfest was a former SEC commissioner who is now a professor at Stanford. And he has tried to convince various corporations, when they go public, to put in their articles of incorporation and bylaws provisions that say, Anybody who buys our shares and becomes a shareholder who wants to bring a 1933 Act claim must bring it in federal court. That will stop this problem and force the big victory that uh, we just had in the Supreme Court to be mooted. Now, in fact, some companies have already started this, and currently there's litigation pending in Delaware and California where this is going to be resolved. But this conflict may be moot shortly. Right. Thanks, Chet. So, Jeremy, coming in hot. Glad you made it. Um, jump in here. So, I guess, just generally, is this the right decision? Grunfest clauses aside, at least for the moment. Um, you know, the, the criticism from the business community has been, uh, you know, if you're thinking about taking your company public, beware, because now plaintiffs have an extra arrow in their quiver. They can sort of venue shop between state and federal jurisdiction to find a more friendly uh, venue for their claims. Um, you know, how do you respond to that? Sure, and I uh, apologize for my Willis Reed-like uh, entrance, um, but uh, yeah, I think on the on the statutorily, I think uh, I think the, the Supreme Court got it right. I think there is a specific grant of uh, of concurrent jurisdiction in the state courts. That's what it was applied, and there needed to be something to convince someone like Gorsuch, who's really a strict constructionist, who's looking at the text, to to veer from that. You're going to have to show clear statutory intent in in the SLUSA to get out of state court. And so it wasn't that surprising reading oral arguments uh, th that it went the way it went. Congratulations to Darren on, on a great job on that. Um, w whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing, I have to say, you know, our firm practices primarily in federal court. And then you have a lot of times where we're bringing claims under, under the 33 Act and 34 Act. And then there's a state court action that's, that, that, that's around. And usually those cases are actually, you know, they get stayed ultimately. But ultimately, when you, want, when you want to settle your case, all of a sudden, then you have to, you have to work in the, the state court actions. A lot of times, not really bringing a lot of added value because they've been stayed um, to the case. But you have to ultimately, they come to the table, and they're looking to, uh, to, as it were, get a piece of the pie. So I think 
you know, I, I think it's a mixed bag. I think that it's clearly good if, 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 if 33 Act allowed for concurrent jurisdiction, it's, it's, it's good that the Supreme Court kept that in place. I think in a practical matter, when there is overlapping claims, as, uh, as Chet referenced, I think it's really, it, it, but for us, it's become, it, it does become quite bothersome, quite frankly, to have state court claims um, that, that, that are moving along with the federal court claims, causing confusion, ultimately causing, when you try to resolve these cases, causing confusion uh, therein. If there is a case that's only 33 Act, if you want to pick state court and you're not in federal court, then all, all the wells. It's probably better to be in state court, so it's a good thing. But I don't think, you know, from a practitioner's perspective, I don't think it's a completely, um, it's, it's a complete, you know, completely great development. I think it's a mixed bag, quite frankly. Thanks, Jeremy. So, Darren, let's just put a bow on this. Uh, you know, with Chet's, uh, the talk, with Chet's dis discussion about the Grunfest clauses and the pending litigation aside, this is at a minimum a momentary win for investors. Uh, but is there anything that Congress could do as well that might blunt the impact of this decision? And do you think they'll do anything about it? Well, I think um, to put a bow on a very dry subject uh, <laughs> for non-lawyers, 33, 98, you know, a state court, federal court. I mean, I think what this um, decision confirms is that uh, the Supreme Court will protect the ability of investors to uh, vindicate their rights under existing law. It doesn't alter the fact that Congress can revisit issues. But I think, you know, it does make a difference if you're Washoe County in Nevada or King County in Washington, and you have a pension fund consisting of people from that jurisdiction, of course, public workers, um, or a Taft-Hartley fund, or whatever it may be, that there's a benefit to litigating your claims before a two jury of your peers. Um, I think they're gonna have a different response to defrauded investors from King County if you're in Washington than if you get transferred to a New York City uh, courtroom. So there is a, a real benefit. And there's substantive benefits beyond that. For example, in California, most people won't appreciate this, but in California State Court, you don't need a unanimous jury verdict to prevail as a plaintiff. In federal court, you do. So one juror rules against your pension fund at trial even though you feel you've clearly been victimized and you lose. So there, there are differences. Um, certainly Congress can revisit this area of the law. Um, I suspect with a 51-49 majority in the Senate <clears throat> and a House that people expect may flip, I, I don't think that there's a lot of worry that this is an issue that's high on anyone's priority list. Because as Jonathan and Jeremy point out, this only affects what I referred to as 1933 Act claims, of which are probably 20 or 25 a year, 15% uh, of all securities litigation. So it's not a, a major point. So I, I don't view it as something that's going to uh, be addressed by Congress. It just doesn't seem to warrant it. And like Jeremy said, even though 1933 Act claims can be brought in state courts, the vast majority of them are actually brought in federal courts anyway, so it's somewhat of a moot issue. Yeah. All right, thanks, Darren. So let's try to spice it up for you guys a little bit. Jeremy, um, our members understand that sort of the basis for most securities cases are either financial misrepresentations or omissions. Recently, we've been seeing a, a new trend develop in, in something being called uh, event-driven litigation. We've got a laundry list of scandals, uh, or events at, at prominent companies that our audience will, you know what, let's just do this as an exercise. Let's see if you guys are still with us. Uh, I'll call out a name of a company or an event or a scandal, and you give me the other one, right? So if I said to you, Deepwater Horizon Explosion Oil Spill, what company do you associate with that? Thank you. You're still alive. All right. Um, <laughs> if I said Equifax, I'm looking for a two-word answer, what would you say? Great. There you go. Uh, let's try one more. If I said... Three and a half million fake bank, bank, bank and credit card accounts to unwitting consumers. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And we've had also a slew of sort of Harvey Weinstein-esque behavior-related cases at major companies, Wynn Resorts, Liberty Tax. So, Jeremy, uh, get us started. What are these non-traditional securities cases about? How are the courts dealing with them? And then, if you would, you know, discuss some of the successes, but also the challenges that these cases present. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. The you know, basically, event-driven litigation is is described as something that's really not a financial restatement, or not a finan not a, not not triggered by an impairment, a write-down, or traditionally a restatement. 
Now, that's typically, a lot of times, the, the, the challenges are is, I think when you go to a federal judge and they look at the securities laws and you say that their statements were mis false and misleading, they're, usually you're saying they're financial statements, they're usually thinking about metrics, financial metrics, their earnings, their revenues, et cetera. And so that was really the basis for, for a lot of the securities fraud lawsuits um, in, in, in the, uh, in, in, at the dot-com bubble, in the, uh, after, in the wake of WorldCom and Enron, and also the, the, thereafter in 2009 and 2008, 2009, 2010, there were a lot of impairments or write-downs that triggered a lot of the financial uh, meltdown uh, litigation. And that's really what courts a lot of times think they're supposed to be seeing when they're presented with a, uh, with a securities fraud. What's happened is, is it's, first of all, Sarbanes-Oxley has actually done a very good job. And Sarbanes-Oxley has cleaned up a lot of the accounting risk statements. The auditors seemingly, um, at least through, through the past 10, 12 years or 10, 15 years, have actually been, there have been less financial risk statements than there were 15, 20 years ago. And so that's, that's actually a good thing. And that's, that's actually a positive development for everyone. And so the but securities litigation, therefore, is, is morphing into something that, that's broader, but really has always been broader. Uh, securities action, 10B, it's, it's pretty simple. Any materially false and misleading statement that's made um, that investor relies on, now we have reliance fraud on the market, that ultimately that causes a loss to investors. That's simple. And, and where the company or defendants act with scienter, and so act with, with knowledge. And so anytime someone makes a knowing false statement that investors should be relying upon, can be the basis for a securities fraud lawsuit. So that means, what that means is, is that if some, a, a company is engaging in money laundering, even though the financial metrics are actually accurate, they, they expensed the bribe to, uh, to, to, to Uruguay properly, it's still a, a potentially securities fraud if you make a statement that, that leads, misleads an investor. And that's really what courts are grappling with now is a lot, because Sarbanes-Oxley has cleaned up a lot of the straight financial misstatements, courts are grappling with, well, we're getting cases that are not really financial misstatements, but they're misstatements. There's, uh, there's uh, statements regarding briberies, there's statements, there's issues regarding data breaches, as we've said, there's em emissions, and that really is, is something that's causing a lot of the securities lawsuits that are being brought now, but the courts are struggling with, well, this isn't securities fraud, this is, this is something else. And so just, just a few examples of cases are, we, we were, were lead counsel in the uh, Petrobras class action that settled for $3 billion, and primarily that case, although there was an impairment, it really wasn't a financial misstatement case, more as it was a straight out bribery um, um, case. It, it was basically, there was a, a cartel that was, that was formed by Petrobras, which was, the large, which was Brazil's uh, oil company, it was the national oil company, um, owned 50% by the government. And basically there was a, a, a scheme whereby the, the company worked with its contractors to inflate contracts by about $20 billion, all with the purpose of funneling back about $3 billion to the company's executives and to members of the, uh, of the Congress in Brazil. Ultimately, it caused one-third of the Brazilian Congress to be um, indicted. It caused two pre the, uh, two, one president to be impeached, another former president to be indicted. The current president, Michel Temer, they decided, the, the, the Congress, um, decided not to allow an impeachment proceeding to, to go against him. He was involved in the scheme because they just wanted stability for the country. So that's, that's the re really a, a very um, broad scheme, but the financial metric portion of the claim wasn't necessarily apparent. And so there the court had allowed, we, there, was, there was financial issues regarding impairment, but there's also, there also misstatements regarding statements that we're, we act with integrity, we don't engage in any bribery, we have the best um, compliance policies. And the question is, is, does that, is that a material misstatement? Does that lead to a claim? And defendants argued very strongly, no, it doesn't. It's, that's, that, those, that's puffery. That's considered something that really no one relies on. Those aren't hard statements that really could be said to be false and misleading that mislead investors. Obviously, though, I think everybody in this room, if we ask them, would you think that a, a statement regarding a fraud or regarding bribery would mislead you? I think I think everybody would raise their hands here. I'm not even going to test it. However, court, defendants have argued successfully in courts throughout the country that really those statements that we act with integrity, we have the right compliance, those are quote unquote puffery, and nobody's really relying on them anyhow. And they can't, they can't by definition. It's like advertisement. It can't, our, our prices are insane. Well, you know, that, that's your prices. That's not. No one's really relying on that. That's just crazy Eddie talking. And so that's what a lot of courts have looked at um, these statements as being. And so 
in Petrobras, it was successful to get the court to agree that these were statements that were, that were, that were false and misleading, that were critical statements that investor relied on. We were also involved in the uh, Yahoo data breach case. I think it's the first successful data breach case. I think uh, thereafter, th there's going to be a lot of very good uh, data breach cases like Equifax going through the courts. But there, we settled with um, defendants for $80 million. And the case there focuses on, in 2014, um, Yahoo was uh, Russian um, intelligence uh, officials, uh, through their work, had, had breached and uh, infiltrated Yahoo's uh, um, systems, and basically we were able to access the data of over three billion, of basically all of Yahoo's users, the three billion users. And the company had a duty to disclose, they didn't make any false statements, but the SEC guidelines stated that they had some duty to disclose if they were subject to a data breach. And also they had made statements regarding their compliance. Really Yahoo caught itself in a problem because the company knew right away that there was a breach, and all they had to do was to protect their customers, they had to just inform them to change their passwords. They didn't even have to tell them about the breach. If they just told them to change their passwords, they would have been protected from the Russian hackers. What happened was is that the company basically didn't want to do that. That would hurt the user experience. So they didn't tell anybody to change their passwords. They let the customers for two years remain vulnerable to, to, to hackers stealing their personal information. Actually, their, their information was, was, was sold online. And, and basically, they let their customers for two years remain vulnerable to this data breach. How did it come out ultimately? How did Yahoo and how, how, well, how did the public learn about the breach? In 2016, right before their merging with Verizon for a, uh, about a $5 billion merger, um, th there's being sold on the black market, the internet's black market, 200 million Yahoo user accounts. And someone calls up Yahoo and says, listen, do you, I don't know if you realize you've, you've been breached here. Someone's selling on the black market 200 million of your customers' information. Yahoo's caught in a problem. Well, wow, people, people are finding out here. It's being sold. The information is being sold. What does Yahoo do? Yahoo denies it. They say, no, 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 that's, that's incorrect. That's not our information. That, 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 that's, that's, not, that's not the case. And so they, even when they're brought, brought with the sale of their information on the internet, they still deny it. Ultimately, then, as they're going through the merger with Verizon, Verizon does a deep dive into the, uh, into the company's uh, um, uh, uh, data compliance policies and, and other material issues, and they say, listen, we have a real problem. Um, this is a material event that we can break the merger. Finally, um, Yahoo uh, fesses up and admits to a data breach. Really, really bad actions by a company that knew for over two years um, of the case. And there, the, the SEC actually um, settled with Yahoo for 35 million private investors, and that's the good work that everybody's doing here as acting as lead plaintiffs in this case. In our case, the private investors received $80 million. So really a victory for investors and in showing you how private litigation is really helpful in the courts. And so these cases, to, 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 to wind it up, these types of cases, a data breach isn't something that a court is thinking tr traditionally triggers the securities laws. When they think securities and financial false financial statements, they think your earnings are wrong, your, the restatement is wrong, the, the financial statements are wrong. Now, when there's a financial restatement, it's easy for a court to say, well, the company's admitting by restating, they admitted that their statements were materially false and misleading. It's very easy to plead falsity. The company's basically admitted to falsity. Much harder to get falsity when you say our data compliance systems are correct, our processes are correct. Those are considered, those are much fuzzier statements, and courts have been getting tripped up and saying, well, these aren't statements we should really allow to be. This isn't securities fraud, this is corporate mismanagement. And so a lot of these cases are falling by the wayside, unfortunately, because the courts are getting confused. There's no doubt under the 34 Act and 33 Act that these are false statements. Investors rely upon it as part of the mix of information, and they're being harmed. But courts are struggling with, 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 with these cases. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. So, uh, Chet, 2017 was a really busy year for securities litigation. Over 400 cases were filed. That's a 120-plus percent increase uh, over the annual amount of filings uh, in history. Um, why do you think, and I should say, event-driven litigation contributed to that rise. So uh, why do you think these cases are increasingly being filed? And maybe importantly for our trustees in the room, how do you think, uh, you know, what should they be on the lookout for? Should they be asked to consider sort of an, an event-driven case? Yeah. First of all, I think there's a number of reasons why these cases have been brought. Uh, two are, uh, over the last seven years, the U.S. Supreme Court came down with two decisions, the Matrix Initiatives decision and the Omnicare decision, which actually said for the first time that an adverse event could be the basis for a securities case. 
So there was somewhat of a law change that allowed these cases. The second reason is just like your traditional financial fraud case, the stock goes down, investors lose money. Here, an adverse event happens, it's very big, it hurts the company going forward, reputation is tarnished, there's undisclosed liabilities, and the stock goes down. So shareholders are filing these cases to recover losses, just like in the traditional cases. But they're very different. And let me illustrate a point. Not every adverse event is a securities fraud. If a satellite falls out of the sky and lands on the corporate headquarters of GE, that's an adverse event if it destroys the, the headquarters. And the stock is going to go down. But that's not a securities fraud. Similarly, when we talk about, let's say, the data breach cases, this is not a situation where Equifax, for example, tried to do something wrong. They were hacked by outsiders that led to people's customers' data being you know, out there and the, their possible ID theft and other negatives to it. How is that the company's fault? And that's what corp, corps have to grapple with, and that's what institutional investors have to grapple with. What you have to look at is what were the statements that the company made? In the Equifax case, well, clearly they didn't want this to happen, but if you actually look at their public statements, they basically say, we're aware of data breaches, but here at Equifax, we spend millions of dollars on security, making sure that data breaches don't happen. And similar statements, well, Obviously, it happened, and it happened to virtually 50% of the United States who, who were basically uh, now subject to identify, identity theft because you didn't have those security systems in place. So A, you have a possible false statement. You then have to prove that they knew there was a problem with their security. And in the Equifax situation, what happened was through the website portals, through the software, there was a problem. The problem was known. There was a patch that was actually known to people and the ID departments that you could easily install to fix the problem. They knew about it, and they didn't fix it for months. It wasn't like a day or two. It was months. With that, you now can start to build a case where they didn't intend to do anything bad, but because they made puffing kind of statements and knew there was a problem and didn't disclose it, you have a potential case. So to make a long story short, if you're an institutional investor and you're looking at these cases, you have to look at what was the statements made and is there potential proof that they were knowingly false. Thank you. All right, Darren, wrap us up here on event-driven litigation because um, we kind of got to get on our horse a little bit. We're falling behind. Are these cases here to stay is there, or do you think the courts are going to push back and sort of dissuade institutional investors from bringing them? Well, <clears throat> I think the, the notion that something like Equifax or Yahoo does not involve fraud is uh, a hard argument to make. I mean, everybody in this room, as Jeremy pointed out, recognizes there was misconduct. As Chet points out, um, that does not necessarily mean as an investor you're entitled to recovery. In Equifax, you bought it at 140, you wake up the next day, it's $95 a share, and then you're told that there was this big data breach, and of course the insiders sold $2 million of their own stock days before they told everyone else. That is indicia of fraud. All that said, um, you know, 47% of securities claims are dismissed at the pleading stage, and so, Jeremy's point about how sometimes it's hard to convince judges. For me, when you see misrepresentations, a core failure of the operations, and huge insider profiteering, that reads a good securities case and people are entitled to compensation. I think that said, you're still going to see significant dismissals, and it's a tough road to hoe, and that's why I think we celebrate whether it's Matrix, Omnicare, or the decision in Cyan, when we get an appellate victory, they're hard to come by. Um, so I think we're still going to continue to face very high dismissal rates. That said, these are an important vehicle. When you look at cases <clears throat> every year, you, you see between 2 and $5 billion are returned to investors in situations like Wells Fargo, Petrobras, 
Enron. And it's important that the institutions in this room take a lead in these cases because every one of us up here will attest to the fact that when an institution is leading the charge, the recoveries are somewhere between three and 10 times larger than when individuals without the same fiduciary experience lead them. So I, I do think it's important to still bring them, but it's a tough road to hoe. All right, thanks, Darren. So Chet, let's go overseas. Um, Every year during this panel, we talk about the continued significant allocation that NCPERS member plans have to international equities and debt. Um, I pulled the 2017 uh, NCPERS study numbers that, you know, from the study that was released in January. Those numbers today stand at 17.8% international equity, 5.4% international debt. And, you know, 164 plans responded, almost $2 trillion in assets. So it's a fair representation of what's in this room. Um, Non-U.S. cases continue to be of importance to NCPERS members plan, member plans. So if you would, and just a sort of mixed bag, talk about some of the things you've been observing in this area, touch on new laws or, or developments in existing uh, laws for class and group uh, cases abroad, parallel, uh, parallel actions in the same jurisdiction, notable settlements, new filings. Uh, take your pick. That's a lot of questions and it's a big world. Um, if we were having this conversation seven years ago, there'd be nothing to s discuss. There weren't class actions or big group litigations abroad. Now we can virtually go to every area in the world and have a detailed discussion as to what's happening. I'll try to narrow it to a few points of, 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 of areas where something significant has happened recently that is kind of potentially changing uh, what's going on in those cases. Let's start with Australia. Australia is the spot where there are more securities class actions outside of the US than any, any other venue. There were 45 or so of these class actions filed in the last five years. And because of that, regulators are now taking a hard look because of Australia corporations are not exactly thrilled with this uh, uh, bunch of litigation coming at them. They're taking a hard look at whether this is gonna continue or whether it should be regulated in some way. So. That is now currently happening, and that may have a, a major impact in Australia. Another thing to understand in Australia is there are two types of class actions. There are opt-out class actions, which are similar to the US. Somebody brings in an action, and every investor is in it unless you ask to be out of it. But they also have opt-in litigations, which you have to ask to affirmatively be in it. For various reasons, Australia mostly has been opt-in litigation area. And the reason is, is they have loser pays provisions in Australia, and there are no contingent fees allowed. For those of you who don't know what a loser pay provision is, in the US, if you lose a securities class action, you're disappointed. You didn't recover anything, but that's out. That's pretty much it. You didn't pay your lawyers. You're not out of pocket. You're no worse off. In Australia, like other places, if you lose the case, not only are you disappointed, but you owe the other side their costs and fees. This is minimal tens of thousands of dollars, much more likely hundreds of thousands of dollars. So to mitigate that risk, litigation funders have come on. They actually finance these litigations, they take the risk, they pay the counsel, they pay the cost of the litigation, and if at the end of the day there's a loser pay provision if you lose the case, it's their problem, not your problem. Now for this, they take a big percentage. But litigation funders who really run the show in Australia prefer these opt-in class actions. And the reason was every plaintiff that went along with them had to sign an agreement and they knew that they could recover their piece of the action at the end of the day. With opt-out class actions, Absent class members, they had a tough time collecting their fees. Well, in October of 2016, the Federal Court of Australia came down or permitted for the first time a common fund class action to take place, which allows litigation funders to recover their piece from the entire class. And I think you're now gonna see a change in the way those litigations go forward. There'll be more of these open opt-out class actions. Another interesting development is Japan. In 2016, for the first time, Japan permitted group actions and securities actions. However, Japan is kind of an interesting jurisdiction. 
A, it has loser pays, which is risky, but even worse, it doesn't permit litigation funders. That is very risky. On the other hand, Japan's laws, if there is a false financial statement, are incredibly favorable to investors. There is no scienter requirement. You don't have to prove intent. There is no reliance requirement. So it's going to be very interesting to see how Japan develops. In fact, the Olympus case settled last year for ne nearly $100 million. So Japan might be a ripe jurisdiction going forward. Another important area is the Netherlands. The Netherlands may, since the Morrison case in the US, which kind of forced institutional investors out of US courts when they have securities that they purchased overseas, Netherlands is emerging as the place of choice for cross-border securities litigation. And the reason for that is their courts have shown a willingness to, in settlements, to approve opt-out global class action settlements. This is important because if a defendant is being sued in multiple countries, it wants to be able to globally resolve a case in one shot. And the Netherlands is allowing that. And we're seeing some of the largest settlements abroad come out of these Dutch courts. Uh, the Fortis NV case just settled for 1.2 billion euros, or $1.3 billion. Uh, the settlement hearing will be in July. And there, the Shell case was the first mega case, a $353 million settlement that the Dutch courts approved. Lastly, another development is in 2018, India for the first time passed a, a law that is allowing class actions. How that plays out will be interesting. We don't even know if US investors will be allowed in, to participate in those class actions, but under India's general law, it seems like they should be. The last big area which you alluded to is the fact that we are now seeing in jurisdictions multiple group or class or collective actions being filed. The Volkswagen case is a perfect example. There were 1,400 individual cases filed in Volkswagen and 10 separate group cases filed in both Germany and the Netherlands. How that's going to play out, how that gets resolved is going to be very interesting. And we're seeing that more and more in other jurisdictions. And many of these jurisdictions, like Australia, don't have a method to consolidate these type of cases. So how that plays out is going to be interesting. Thanks, Chet. So <clears throat> in the interest of time, we're going to come back to the US. Um, and we're going to talk about the Trump administration in six minutes, which I guarantee will be the shortest amount of time discussed on this uh, administration in, on any forum that you might find. Um, Darren, when President Trump was sworn in, there were 130 vacancies on the federal bench. He's nominated over 100 judges as of last week. Uh, the Senate had confirmed 34 to the U.S. Court of Appeals and the U.S. District Courts. We spent a lot of our time today talking about the U.S. Supreme Court, but it's the lower courts where, where you know, the, the law is made. Um, what do you think will be the impact of having more conservative judges uh, on the courts? Before we go on to that, I just want to put in your terms a bow on this issue about international. And on international, you know, Germany, India, Canada, Australia, it, 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 you've heard 98 Act, opt-in, opt-out. I mean, for those of you who are non-lawyers, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming. And I think the, the important point to take away is that, particularly with respect to international litigation, you need someone in the United States who you can rely on to give you objective advice, because choosing between German action number one, German action number 23, loser pays, litigation funder, uh, it's impossible for a lawyer and a non-lawyer, it's doubly impossible. So I would just suggest that you find someone who's not transactional in nature, who you look back five years and you can rely on their advice and look forward five years and hopefully rely on their advice and have them direct you through this thicket because it really is that. There is potential in these international litigations. They generally yield every year five to 10% uh, of what domestic litigation yields, but it's important to follow. And now shifting over to the Trump administration's appointments. It's true there have been 17 appellate judges appointed, one Supreme Court justice, and 17 district court judges uh, since President Trump was elected. Um, uh, there's two being um, confirmed in the Senate today and two scheduled for confirmation tomorrow. Um, 
it's a mixed bag. I think that the Trump administration has delivered what it promised, conservative jurists. Um, there's been a lot of rancor. Uh, the last few days, we've seen um, a lot of uh, media over the fact that some of the senators feel um, isolated uh, and uh, procedures that have been recognized for decades are being ignored. That is what's called the blue slip process where a home state senator uh, must return their acquiescence to this particular candidate or they will not be confirmed. And that's something that's been uh, part of the confirmation process for judges for decades. Uh, the other day, a Seventh Circuit judge was confirmed notwithstanding the fact that the senator from Wisconsin declined to return her blue slip. And so I think you're seeing a um, increasing desperation by the administration to get um, uh, confirmations done quickly because I think they feel the heat that we've all seen, which is that many uh, Republican members of the lower house, of the House of Representatives, are not running because they think the House is going to flip. And I think that's indicative that there's a chance that the Senate may flip. Um, and because of that, they'd like to get these confirmations through. Uh, and so I, I see processes and procedures that are not being followed in an effort to make sure they take advantage of their 5149 um, advantage in the Senate to get these confirmations through. And I think you'll continue to see that, how many they'll be able to get done before November, who knows. Thanks. Uh, Jeremy, let's see if we can sneak one more in here on the SEC. Uh, the SEC has never allowed a company to sell shares in an IPO and also ban, uh, let them ban investors from bringing class actions. Um, some think that there is some groundswell to where the SEC might be considering uh, a change in policy and might consider allowing, investor, uh, allowing companies to force investors to settle disputes through arbitration. Um, please, if you could quickly talk about this issue and explain why uh, NCPERS trustees should be paying close attention. Sure. I mean, basically, the Supreme Court in 2013 ruled that you could put in a contract, let's say your uh, credit card contract, you could put in, um, you agree to an arbitration, and you agree in that arbitration that you won't, you won't proceed with a class action. That sounds unconscionable. Every lower court in the land ruled it was unconscionable, and that you couldn't do it. The Supreme Court, five to four, um, along party lines, ruled that actually you could take away someone's right to bring a class action. Now, the question is, is you don't have in a typical securities transaction, you don't have a contract. What do you have? You have a bylaw. And so now the question is, is can you put in that bylaw anyone who purchases a security must bring an arbitration and cannot bring a class action? That is the new um, uh, front on this war between uh, class action litigation and, and trying to uh, and, and, and arbitration. Ultimately, um, the uh, uh, Pivover in, in, in a... In, the, in, in July of 2017, encouraged um, at, a, at a Heritage uh, Foundation uh, event, encouraged corporations to try to put these bylaws in uh, in their registration statements and in their in, the, in their corporate bylaws. The, the SEC policy beforehand was was they would not allow um, registrations to proceed or accelerate if they had these bylaws. So there was an encouragement uh, by one of the SEC commissioners to start these bylaws. The Treasury Department just put out a recommendation in October of 2017, also encouraging the use of these bylaws. And so really there's been a lot of heat on the SEC um, uh, chair, Clayton, whether or not he's gonna allow this change in policy to proceed to basically stop NCPERS and other, uh, other um, investors from participating and getting the fruits of a class action. It's quite dangerous. Clayton has been very, very um, non-committal one way or the other. He says he'll give it due process and he says he'll give it a lot of thought, but he's not, com he's not committing to protect investors here. He's not committing to, to keep the SEC's um, traditional viewpoint on this, which indicates is that if he, if he could, he probably would change, change the uh, policy and allow this to go through. So I think we could expect um, that there might be an effort right now, two commissioners, um, Pivor actually just uh, stepped down. There's two uh, commissioners and, and, and seats that are open. And so therefore, I think the issue might be uh, stayed for a while but it'll come up at some point. Thank you, guys. Listen, it's not surprising we've gone over our time, um, but I want to thank you all for your uh, attention and, and uh, participation. Any questions, I know we'll all be around later. Uh, please join me in thanking the panelists.